Good morning. How's the uh, audio level? That sounds pretty good. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, <coughs> to be with you, the Greater Phoenix Church of God, and those of you on the video stream. Thank you so much for that introduction, Jim. So Jim was telling me earlier that you all enjoy scripture-rich messages. So there are 31,109 verses in the Bible, and I figure we should be able to cover about 10% today. What do you think? Is everybody up for that? All right. My name is Doug Drake, and I am a, a member of the Rock Valley Christian Church in Munireta, California. My darling wife of 32 years, Brenda and I, have been attending there for the last seven years. And I'll tell you a little bit during this message about my calling and my walk with the Lord. Um, it's, uh, it's been very interesting. So for the last two years, I've been a member of the School of Ministry at Rock Valley where Pastor Liesenfeld and Pastor uh, Sharpen had been teaching men how to research biblical uh, subjects and how to present them. And so it's my pleasure to present this message to you today. So we'll start my message with a prop because I've discovered, I'm sorry? I don't know how to turn it up. What's that? Oh, okay, good. All right, so I've discovered that good, great messages usually start with a prop. So I'm going to ask, does anybody recognize what this is? It's a rear view mirror. Very good. And for those of you who, let her, who uh, enjoy nostalgia... A rearview mirror. So <clears throat> this, this device uh, allows us to see what's behind us, right? We use it for, for reasons of safety when we're driving. And I'm sure if you've been driving for any period of time, you've probably spent hours looking in, in, into one of these. But the, uh, the title of my scripture is not looking in the rearview mirror. So I'll give you the title in a minute. <clears throat> Metaphorically speaking, people will say, that's in my rearview mirror. So typically, an event that's happened in their life, or possibly a relationship, things that they have tried to forget or put behind them. Um, the other thing that the rearview mirror does for us is it allows us to see who's pursuing us. <laughs> now my hope and prayer is that you're not being pursued by one of these individuals. But this message came to me, <clears throat> um, this message and this idea of, of the rearview mirror and being pursued came to me, um, I wanna say early June. So you know that early morning hour, just as you're beginning to wake, you're, you're not quite asleep and you're not quite awake. You're in that very twilight kind of sleep. And for a period of about three or so days, I found myself looking in the rearview mirror at things that had happened in my life, people that I had known, and uh, just reminiscing. But something, something else happened, and that was that the adversary came along and took the opportunity to point out every place that I had sinned or transgressed God's law or had, uh, had a, an issue with someone in my life. And at first, I didn't recognize what was going on. I just kind of, you know, I got up, I woke up, I shrugged it off and went to work. But about the third or so day, about midday, I was sitting at my desk having lunch. And my mind started to wander. And again, there were the accusations. So that brought on prayer, fasting, and rebuke in the name of Jesus, and the, the attacks finally stopped. So what I want to do today, or where, where I want to start this morning is, I want to ask you, who pursues us? So if you like to title your sermons, the title of my sermon today is, Who Pursues Us? Does the devil pursue us? If you would turn with me to 1 Peter verse 5, 
1 Peter 5 and verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Now it's interesting if you have watched Animal Planet, or for those from my generation here, Marlon Perkins' Wild Kingdom. Everybody remember that guy? Lions are opportunists. So they prey on the, the, the physically weak, the young, the old, and the inattentive. And this attack that I was just talking about came at a time where my, I wasn't fully conscious. I was inattentive. Turn with me to Matthew 4. Matthew 4 and verse 1. <clears throat> so this is the temptation of Jesus. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit, Matthew 4, verse 1, into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He, and when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up lest you dash your foot against the stone. But Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan. There it is, the rebuke. For it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. The reason that I wanted to talk about the temptation of Jesus in this portion of my sermon is, if the devil, if the devil is so bold and so arrogant to come against the Son of Man, why wouldn't we think that he pursues us also? We need to be mindful of of the deceit of the enemy and the tricks that he uses to try to, to, to guilt us and shame us, especially when, in my case, these sins of the past, I'd already asked God to forgive me, and I know I, I have repented and been forgiven for those things, and yet, in that twilight sleep, the devil wanted to come against me and try to make me feel shame and guilt. Well, it's not going to happen because we know that Jesus overcame right here in this story. And it's through Jesus that we have the promise of eternal life. So that brings me to uh, my next area of the sermon. Does Jesus pursue us? If you would, turn with me to Matthew 18. Matthew 18, verse 11. Matthew 18, 11. <clears throat> but he said to them, that would be 19, 11, sorry. Eighteen eleven. here we go. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine and go to the mountains to seek the one that is astray? And if he should find it, assuredly I say to you, he rejoices more over that sheep than over the ninety-nine that did not go astray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. 
So I told you in the introduction that my wife and I had attended with Rock Valley for about seven years. Uh, prior to that, we spent about three years, what I romantically say as wandering in the desert. We had been a member of a congregation prior for some 15 years, uh, and I'll tell you a little more about that in the next segment. But uh, we, uh, we came to the conclusion that where we were was not a healthy place. And so when we left, we were hurt, we were discouraged, and I was downright angry with God for leading me to a place where I had encountered that kind of pain when all I wanted to do was worship and give him glory. But Jesus never gave up on me and my wife. And one day, <clears throat> one day she was out on Facebook looking around and she found some friends that we had attended in that other congregation with. And she noticed all of the pictures that this person had posted of the feast that they had attended. And she was like, wow, I wonder where they're, where are they going to the feast? And so uh, she put her detective hat on, figured out where they were, and that, that place was Rock Valley. So she's like, I want to go to services there. So Rock Valley Christian Church is 60 miles from where we live. But it's a pleasure to go every week because if we've had a really long and, and hard week, things have been busy, work has had all of my attention, that gives us an hour of undivided attention and time to talk on the way to church. Brenda usually sleeps on the way home, so. <laughs> I love you, honey. I'm in so much trouble. It's all good. But uh, anyways, so she finds the website and she's like, Doug, they have a band. And I'm like, okay. So we went to a sermon, and uh, she was like, well, what did you think? And I said, it, it, was, it was nice. It was different than what we were used to. And she said, oh, I want to go back. And I said, you know, it's 60 miles. Could we go every other week? So we did do that for a couple of months. And uh, at her encouragement, finally, I said, all right, I'm in. And we have been going every week for the last seven years. But my point here was Jesus never gave up on us. We were one of the 99 that had gone astray. He healed. He gave me healing. He led me into a relationship with the Father that was so deep and so fulfilling that now I get to stand in front of you and tell you about it. And that is just so awesome. Turn with me to John 17. <clears throat> John 17 and verse 6. <clears throat> Jesus is praying for his disciples. I have manifested your name to the men who you have given me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me. And they have kept your word. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. When we, when we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior, when we repent of our sin, when we are baptized, we become Christ. This prayer is not just for the disciples of his day. This prayer is for us. Jesus goes to God daily and intercedes for us because he loves us so deeply. Turn with me, if you would, to Matthew 28. 
Matthew 28 and verse 20. Breaking into the thought here. <clears throat> and lo, I am with you always, even to, the, even to the end of the age. Amen. Jesus promises to never leave us. We will always be his. So does Jesus pursue us? I, I believe he does. I believe that he wants us to have the same kind of relationship with the Father that he has. So that leads me to my next question. Does God pursue us? Turn with me to Psalm 23, verse 6. Psalm 23, 6. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all of the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So in another translation, this reads, Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life. God loves us so deeply. If you look at everything that God has done in the, in the work of the creation, he did it for us. This planet that we live on, the distance it is from the sun, this entire ecosphere supports human life. God knew before he spoke the first word of creation that we would fall, but he had already planned to send Jesus Christ to redeem us. And why would he do that? Who is this God? who loves us so deeply. So I told you that I'd, I'd give you a little more background on my calling. In 1979, I joined the United, the United States Navy right out of high school. And I spent a year and a half in Great Lakes, Illinois, going to boot camp and electronics technician school and my first set of orders was to a ship that was undergoing overhaul in Seattle, Washington. Somewhere in that travel, shortly after getting to Seattle in about 1981, I, and I think it was in a barber shop, I picked up a magazine that provoked some thoughts about the Sabbath day. Now, I had always wondered why Christians went to church on Sunday, when clearly the seventh day was Saturday. So I read through this magazine and I ordered some of the booklets that were in it and I began to study. This was God calling me and waking, waking me up to the truth. I ordered every booklet that they, they offered. I ordered their Bible study course. I scoured my Bible. I went through and proved every doctrine and everything that, was, that they had printed. And I came to the conclusion that they were right that the Sabbath day was Saturday. Things about Christmas, Easter, heaven and hell, what happens after we die, the resurrection. But I was in the Navy, in a place where I couldn't observe the Sabbath day. There were watches, there were deployments. And so I said, well, if I was an observing Christian, I would observe all of the things in these, these booklets and everything that I had read. And then I put that in a box and put it on a shelf. About four years later, I got sent to the Los Angeles area for recruiting duty where I met my, my wonderful wife. And as those kinds of things go when you're dating, you start having conversations about your beliefs, their, their beliefs. 
And so the box came back out. We went through and looked at a bunch of the stuff, and we said, yeah, if we were observing Christians, we would do this. And everything went back in the box and went back on the shelf. I want to say somewhere around 1991, some six or seven years later, the box came back out. And we actually sought out a congregation, showed up unannounced, no Bible, sat in the back. And the man giving the sermon that day was reading through Genesis, and everywhere that it said God or Lord, he was inserting Yahweh and Elohim. And we looked at one another and said, what is that guy talking about? We had no idea. When the service was over, we couldn't get out of there fast enough. We thought they were crazy people. A few years later, I got my first internet connection, and the whole world opened up. And I was searching this, and I was looking at that. And, and, and I asked my wife, I said, do you remember that sermon we went to? Do you, what was that word that that guy kept using? Elohim. OK, so I look up Elohim. Oh, it's plural. It means mighty ones or rulers. Well, that's not so crazy. What was that? Yahweh. Okay, Yahweh. Yahweh, the proper, God's proper name. Well, that's not so, so strange. Maybe we should give them another try. So we get in, do a little more internet searching to try to find them again, and uh, their leader had died, and those that took over had totally changed directions in the church. So all of the things that I had read and proved that were in that box the church no longer believed. And I said, well, I, I want to find the group that holds to these tenets, right? Because I've proven all this stuff to myself. So we did find a congregation, and we did attend with them for some 15 years, and I told you, it, it, towards the end, it went really badly. And I don't need to get into specifics, but it was just unhealthy, and there was pain. But again, God saw fit through Jesus Christ to lead my wife and I to Rock Valley Christian Church. Turn with me, if you will, to Genesis 3. What, what is the desire of God's heart? Why does he pursue us? Genesis 3 and verse 8. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. What I want to point out here is God's in the garden with Adam and Eve. Walking in the garden, his presence. He's dwelling in the garden with them. Turn with me to Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel 37 and verse 27. Thirty-seven, twenty-seven. My tabernacle, that is my dwelling place, also shall be with them. Indeed, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And then one other scripture. Revelation. Revelation 21. Revelation 21 and verse 3. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he shall dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and will be their God. So it's very obvious that God wants to dwell with us. 
He wants to have a relationship with us, an ongoing, loving relationship for all time, for all eternity. There are multiple scriptures that indicate that God wants to dwell with us. Usually you'll find them saying uh, that he would dwell with the people of Israel, that they would be his people and he would be their God. But why would God want to live with us? I mean, we can be pretty hard on one another in our day-to-day lives. Why would God want to live with us? Turn with me to Genesis. Genesis 1. Genesis 1 and verse 26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on earth. So God made us in his image and likeness. We have not yet achieved that total perfection, but through Jesus Christ, After the resurrection, we will be perfect like Jesus. And we will live with God and Jesus for eternity. And that's what God desires. He desires to live with his creation, to pour out love on us, to see us grow. I'm going to read uh, Hebrews 2, verse 9 through 11 from the uh, NIV, but you can turn there if you'd like. Hebrews 2, verse 9 through 11. We see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, It was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer, that is Jesus, of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. Both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. We are are of the family of God. How awe-inspiring is that to you? We are part of the family of God. And continuing, so Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. You are a brother or a sister of Christ. How awesome is that? That God would bless you in that way. Turn with me to John 1. John 1, verse 12. John 1, verse 12. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Again, reinforcing that idea that we are children of God part of God's family. And a couple other scriptures uh, to reinforce the same idea. Let's turn to Romans 8. Romans 8, 14. Romans 8, 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God These are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, note this, if children, then heirs, 
heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. We have an inheritance. We get to share in the inheritance of Jesus Christ. Who, who is this God that loves us so? That would give us this inheritance, this blessing, this undeserved gift. One other, one other scripture here. Galatians 4. Galatians 4 and verse 4. Galatians 4, 4. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Continuing on in verse 6. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, again, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir. Here it is again. We are heirs of God through Christ. That promise and that gift just boggled my mind that God wants to spend eternity with us, that God wants us to be adopted sons and daughters, that God has an inheritance for each and every one of us. It's just so awe-inspiring. I, I have trouble wrapping my head around it. So let's briefly cover let's briefly summarize what, what's covered so far. Does the devil pursue us? Absolutely. We need to be mindful of the tricks that he will use to try to tempt us. We need to be on our guard. If he was willing to come against our Lord and Savior, we should not doubt that he will try to come against us. Does Jesus pursue us? Absolutely. Jesus has a love for us that's so deep. It's as deep as the love that the Father has. He shares in the vision that he wants us to have the same relationship with God that he has for eternity. Does God pursue us? God wants us to be sons and daughters. God wants to give us an inheritance. God loves us so deeply that he gave his only begotten son that whomsoever would believe should not perish but have everlasting life. What a promise. So let me ask you a question. Who or what do you pursue? Do you pursue status, fame, wealth, a new car, a new job, are there things that are taking your focus off of God and the promise of the inheritance? Are you seeking God every day? Turn with me to Luke 11. Luke 11, and starting in verse 9. Luke 11, 9. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks it will be opened. We should be seeking God every day. We should be knocking on the door. We should be saying, Father, here I am. Your will be done. Guide me. Give me wisdom. Show me what you want me to do. Show me what ministry you have set before me. 
Let's turn to Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles seven. Second Chronicles seven fourteen. So here's a promise from God. Second Chronicles seven fourteen. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. We live in a nation that needs this idea right now. We need to go forth and spread the gospel we need to tell people about the promise of the inheritance and how God desires to make us adopted sons and daughters. How he's promised life eternal through Jesus Christ. Forgiveness of our sin. We need to pray for our nation and our world that God, that they, the people would seek him, that they would repent and that God would heal them and their land. Uh, turn with me, if you will, to Jeremiah 29, 13. 29, 13. Jeremiah 29, 13. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. If we are earnest... In our, in our seeking of God, we, we will find him. He, he is faithful. He will be faithful to us. He will deliver the promises. The first great commandment is to love God with all your heart, all your soul, mind, and strength. In John 14, 6, Jesus says, No one can come to the Father except through me. When I think on those two things, it occurs to me that in order to love God with all my heart, all my soul, all my mind, and all my strength, I have to pursue Jesus with all my heart, all my soul, all my mind, and all my strength. And in so doing, I'll be led to the Father I will receive that promise of salvation, redemption, and an eternal relationship with Jesus Christ and God our Father. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been a pleasure to speak to you today. If I haven't met any of you, I'd like to meet you afterwards at the potluck. Let me leave you with just one thing. From now on, you'll never look at your rearview mirror the same way, I hope. When you glance up into this device while you're driving, may you reflect, pun intended, may you reflect on the great love of God and, and the love of Jesus Christ. May they always be with you. May you be blessed. Thank you.